The topic for this presentation is psychosocial theories and therapy. So we're going to talk about some of the basic theories, and these include psychoanalytic, developmental, interpersonal, humanistic, behavioral, and existential. Remember Freud, this is from your basic 101 psychiatry or psychiatric course. Personality components, and this came from Freud, Freudian psychology, and that included the id, the ego, and the superego. The id was pleasure seeking. This is like your reptilian brain. So it's pleasure seeking behavior and a desire for instant gratification. Ego, though, represents that mature and adaptive behavior. And think of good mental health, you have to have a really uh, intact ego. A super ego is reflects that moral and those ethical concepts. This is like our spirituality, one of the uh, ways we strive to improve ourselves. Also, according to Freud, we have three levels of awareness. Think about the iceberg comparison. We have the conscious, which is really a kind of a small portion of the of the iceberg. We have the pre-conscious, and those are thoughts and emotions that are not currently in our awareness, and those are um, just kind of at the surface of the iceberg. And then the subconscious, which really makes up the largest portion of you know what out what's outside of our awareness or that lower part under the water iceberg. So psychoanalysis, the goal of psychoanalysis is to make the unconscious conscious. And some of the techniques utilized in psychoanalysis are dreams, because Freud said dreams reflect the subconscious and that all of them have significance. They have significant meaning. So clients were encouraged in their sessions with Freud to discuss their dreams, and then Freud would interpret them and inform the patient of their relevance to their current life situation. He also used a technique called free association, and this meant that the patient would basically lie on a couch with the analyst behind them and just say whatever came to their minds. So. Freud believed that that first thing that popped into your mind was your subconscious trying to reveal some insight. Um, Freud also de developed and defined ego defense mechanisms, which is a really important thing for us to understand because if we recognize the defense mechanisms our patients are using, um, we, we can gain an understanding of how they cope with, you know, painful thoughts, feelings, or events. Freud also developed the five stages of psychosexual development, and this included oral stage, which was from birth to 18 months, anal stage, 18 months to 36 months, phallic, three to five years, latency, five to 11 or 13 years, and <laughs> that's not spelled right, a gentile, gentile stage of 11 to 13 years. So he felt that psychopathology resulted when a person had difficulty making the transition from one stage to the next. Um, you're still going to be you know, charged with understanding these stages of sexual uh, psychosexual development um, because it is still an important part of understanding how we develop as as humans and also this these stages of psychosexual development kind of laid the foundation for the development of 
other stages or developmental stages from people like Erickson and Piaget. Freud also helped to define some of the treatment barriers, and we've covered this before, which they included countertransference and transference. And he felt that it was important for us as providers to be aware when these situations occur so that we can recognize it and not let it be a barrier to our approach to our patients or treatment. So defense mechanisms. The primary purpose of defense mechanisms is to help to reduce anxiety. Remember that, defense mechanisms. People use them to cope with anxiety and stress. Nearly all of them are outside of our conscious awareness. Um, and there is uh, the exception though to that is suppression. So some of them are deliberate. You need to know about these different levels of defense mechanisms. Some of them are more immature or primitive, and that includes denial, regression, acting out, dissociating, compartmentalization, projection, and reaction formation. This should be, these, all of these defense mechanisms should be familiar to you all. Uh, you do need to be able to understand um, and interpret or recognize when patients are using these types of uh, defenses. Um, I think some of them are easier to understand, um, especially denial, regression. Those types of things will um, kind of jump out at you when patients are using them. Um, dissociation or compartmentalization might be a little um, more different, uh, as well as reaction formation. So please uh, go back and review these, and they are outlined well in your text. Less primitive or more mature defense mechanisms include that repression, displacement, displacing your uh, like anxiety or your anger onto something or someone else. Uh, intellectual intellectualization. This is commonly used. Uh, rationalization a lot used a lot. Um, undoing. Mature defense mechanisms include sublimation, self-assertion, suppression, and we know suppression is a conscious defense mechanism, a compensation, altruism, anticipation, affiliation, and self-observation or self-awareness. So if you look at these mature defense mechanisms, the vast majority of them are, these are adaptive. They're not maladaptive. So they can be helpful and um, create, help patients to have, uh, build a healthier ego. So they strengthen the ego. So some other developmental theories that you should be familiar with are Erickson or Eric Erickson and his psychosocial stages of development. So Freud, psychosexual, Eric Erickson was psychosocial. So he's building on the importance of our external environment, the influences of the people around us, our life situations, and how we progress through a basically linear stages of development. And the, the state, Erickson's stages are emphasized throughout nursing um, because understanding, if we understand where our patients are as far as their stage of development, then we can help them to resolve some of the, the challenges associated with each stage. So for instance, if you have someone who is at maybe their preschooler or um, teenager stage and they're having a lot of difficulties with trust, we can look back into their early developmental stages and say, well, maybe this person never 
was never able to complete this particular developmental stage successfully. And then we could work on helping them to resolve whatever conflict it is that's keeping them from progressing. Gene Piaget and his cognitive stages of development are also very important in terms of helping us to understand um, as, especially the capacity people have to understand or comprehend the world around them um, at, in regards to those times when they experience conflict. So Piaget, he explored how intelligence and cognitive functioning developed in children. And he believed that human intelligence progresses in a linear fashion through a series of stages that were based on age. And this is especially helpful in understanding how to communicate best with children. Because if we can, if we have an understanding of what a child can comprehend, then we're going to have a greater success in communicating in a way that they are actually going to be able to comprehend. For instance, think about a child at the age of, you know, four or five years of age. They have no way of really comprehending uh, the concept of, you know, of dying or death. So they don't really recognize that that is a permanence. So, you know, again, understanding where they're at can help us to communicate with them better. So be familiar with Piaget uh, because that will also help you to understand how to work with people better and knowing where they're coming from. It also really helps you if you're working in pediatrics to be able to communicate better with parents or other family members um, about how they can um, communicate better with their children. Harry Stack Sullivan uh, is the basically the founder of interpersonal um, theory and Harry Stack Sullivan believed that we developed and matured based on the value of relationships. So he always factored in that the importance of connecting with other people. He believed that our personality was more than just our individual characteristics and that personality was indeed shaped by, of course, not just immediate family, but those relationships we developed with friends from, gosh, from elementary school all the way uh, through uh, life. So he felt that inadequate or unsatisfying relationships caused a lot of anxiety. And when he, you know, he used his, skills as far as relationship development in working with those folks who were seriously mentally ill, like had schizophrenia, and he was actually able to have some very good outcomes with folks just based on the interaction and openness between um, the therapist and with the patient and also um, having patients interact with one another. So Harry, Sol Harry Stack Sullivan laid the groundwork for milieu therapy and essentially changed the way we um, approach or the way we have inpatient psychiatric units designed. Uh, we've talked a little about Hildegard Keplaw. She developed really the first systematic framework for psychiatric nursing, and that was the nurse-patient relationship. She, her theory built upon or expanded upon Harry Stack Sullivan's work. 
she was the first to focus really on what nurses do with patients and remember that what nurses do with our patients instead of what they do to patients Heplaw outlined the roles of the nurse um, and that included the stranger role, which initially the resource person, the teacher, the surrogate, the leader, and the counselor. And here's some information about what, let me see, let me bring off my, my gel. So you can see this little video. relations which emphasize the nurse-client relationships as the foundation of nursing practice. Nurses and clients must work together instead of having the client passively receive treatment. Her theory explains the phases of the interpersonal process, roles in nursing situations, and methods for studying nursing as an interpersonal process. This interpersonal process is the journey to achieve the common goal between the nurse and the client, and this journey is to serve as a maturation process and road to gaining more knowledge for both parties. These are Hildegard's seven nursing roles. The stranger role. The nurse receives a client the same way one meets a stranger in other life situations. They provide an accepting climate that builds trust. The resource role. The nurse answers questions, interprets clinical treatment data, and gives information to the client. In the teaching role, the nurse gives instructions and provides training. It involves analysis and synthesis of the learner's experience. In the counseling role, the nurse helps the client understand and integrate the meaning of current life circumstances and provides guidance and encouragement to make changes. In the surrogate role, the nurse helps the client identify domains of dependence, interdependence, and independence and acts on the client's behalf as an advocate. In the active leadership role, the nurse helps the client assume maximum responsibility for meeting treatment goals in a mutual, mutually satisfying way. In the technical expert role, the nurse provides physical care by displaying clinical skills. These are her stages. In the orientation phase, both parties become acquainted to, to each other in the nurse-patient relationship. Preconceptions are worked through and parameters are established and met. Early levels of trust are developed and roles are begin to be understood. In the identification phase, the client begins to identify problems to be worked on within the relationship. The goal of the nurse is to help the patient to recognize his or her own interdependent or participation role and promote responsibility for self. In the exploitation phase, the client's trust of the nurse is reaching the full potential. The client makes full use of nursing services to solve immediate problems and identifies and orients himself or herself to discharge goals. In the last phase, the resolution phase, the client has met all of his or her needs. There is a mutual termination of the relationship, a sense of security is formed, the patient becomes less reliant on the nurse and increases self-reliance to deal with own problems. Okay. So Hildegard Peplaw also uh, developed the therapeutic nurse patient relationship. So she developed the roles of the nurse as well as the nurse patient relationship. And she uh, defined that orientation phase, the identification phase, exploitation, and resolution. And always keeping in mind that even in that orientation phase, when you encounter the patient for the first time, lay the groundwork for um, the treatment, you also are planning for discharge. 
So be sure that you cover those different phases of the relationship. Uh, your text outlines them very well. Um, some There are at times different words utilized, like for the exploitation phase that is equivalent to like the working phase. Resolution phase is equivalent to the termination phase. So you'll see these words used interchangeably. Hildegard Peplau defined anxiety uh, and talked about the different levels of anxiety and that they were responses, of course, to a psychic threat. Anxiety is very common. One of the main reasons people seek out um, psychiatric care, it is at times very uncomfortable, but it can be beneficial. Mild anxiety is motivating for us. It's that positive state of heightened awareness. So think about how you feel in the morning after you've had that first cup of coffee and you're just kind of raring to go. You're a little bit nervous because you've got a, a test to do, but the motivation is there. It's just mild anxiety, but it can actually be motivating and help you to do better. When you're experiencing moderate anxiety, I want you to think about that sensation that you're um, maybe having so much anxiety that you cannot focus. And it involves that you know decrease in your perceptual field. You can learn to manage that type of anxiety by um, possibly deep by deep breathing doing relax, relaxation techniques uh, those types of things you can also kind of rehearse it so that you feel more prepared moderate anxiety can be decreased to mild anxiety but if it's not managed well or the person has a difficult or challenged in their coping skills then that can progress to severe anxiety which is very uncomfortable and just under that level of panic. So severe anxiety can be rather persistent. It involves feelings of dread or terror. A person cannot be redirected to uh, the task at hand. Um, this person focuses only on scattered details and has um, even that physiological, those physiological symptoms like heart pounding and um, rapid uh, breathing, uh, shallow breathing might hyperventilate, those kinds of things. Blood pressure um, may elevate. And it's, it's very uncomfortable. It hasn't reached the level of panic anxiety. Now, panic anxiety is that's through the roof, completely crippling. Often, thank, thankfully, it doesn't usually last for an extended period of time. Typical panic attacks um, last maybe 10 to, um, to 30 minutes. They can be resolved with medications. You are not going to be able to talk this person through a panic attack. Um, and these folks really need to have um, some intervention, um, most often medication like a, a short-acting benzodiazepine, such as um, Xanax, Alprazolam, or Lorazepam, uh, which in its brand is uh, Ativan. So that person with panic anxiety, they have tunnel vision. Uh, they can even experience delusions hallucinations. They can um, completely freeze and not be able to move, um, may become mute, can't communicate. So um, this is uh, really, you can't talk about it. Severe anxiety, you can work with folks by s maybe helping them with deep breathing. You can work to talk them down. They might need medications, but you do have an opportunity to help them through it. Okay, so no Hildegard Peplau, no um, her stages of the nurse-patient relationship, no those um, stages of anxiety and the roles of the nurse, that's very important. So we're gonna transition to the humanistic theories. And these theories 
uh, focused on individuals and that they are not viewed as neurotic, impulse driven with repressed psychic problems. So this was, um, again, almost going against Freudian psychology and recognizing that we are not just we, we function at a higher level utilizing our neocortex and we're not just at using our reptilian brain. The focus is on a person's positive qualities and that everyone has the capacity to change and recognize um, that they have the potential to improve their life. And in other words, follow your dreams. The counselor or um, an analyst really helped that person um, by, by being like a facilitator, helping them to gain insight into how they can find within them, in themselves the power to change their life. So um, this is Carl Rogers and he developed the person-centered therapy, one of the first um, humanistic therapies. And he was just a delightful man and served in that role of um, basically listening and he practiced unconditional positive regard. He was really the very first to create a client-centered therapy or patient-centered therapy. He talked about patients though as clients and he believed that each person experiences the world differently and they know based on their own experience how to improve their life but that sometimes they just needed to have a person who was supportive and nurturing and he instilled in them the belief that they could heal themselves. He practiced and developed unconditional positive regard for his patients and one of the ways that he demonstrated this regard was through being really genuine and empathetic. So patients felt comfortable with him. So we are now looking at Goldberg's levels of moral development. So I look at the humanistic theories as recognizing that a, a different kind of development that's based on our own really intuition, you know, so that if we develop our insight into our own strengths, then we can become empowered to make changes in our life. So I see that more as like your spiritual development from an internal place. Goldberg's levels of moral development are pushing towards those um, development of our own values, our own moral compass, so to speak. And he developed or defined pre-conventional, which was about punishment, obedience, orientation, which is really at that childlike level. And then progressing to that conventional which is um, um, obeying authority, that uh, social order, helping us to understand what is acceptable and not acceptable behavior. And then that post-conventional was you know, accepting and recognizing all of these universal types of ethics and values. Gilligan went farther in the moral um, developmental stages by incorporating a more nurturing 
um, approach. And Gilligan was one of the first feminist to, and she recognized that all of the previous uh, psychosocial or developmental theories were, you know, developed based on the um, based on a male perspective. And so what she felt was that you had to consider uh, gender or um, female perspectives and recognize that we all, um, that based on, and I hate to go too much into gender because there, it's such a broadly defined, but she did, you know, look at a, the feminine nurturing type of quality and factored that into those, um, those moral stages. And she defined her theory as an ethic of care. Okay, so we are transitioning from the developmental theories into behavioral theories. Um, behavioralism or behaviorism is that school of psychology. It focuses on observable behaviors. It doesn't explain at all how the mind works, but it's very basic. And the basic premise being, hey, if it was learned, it can be unlearned. And Pavlov, you know, he proved this in his experiments with the dog, that you could introduce a stimulus that was unrelated and you could get a response, you know, Pavlov's dog and uh, drooling over food and then when he rang a bell. So you pair an unrelated stimulus and you can get a response. So B.F. Skinner built upon uh, Pavlov's and operant conditioning and felt that people learn behaviors that's based on their history and their past experiences, especially if those experiences were reinforced. So this was, again, that if behavior is learned, it can be unlearned and that we can use rewards and punishments to make changes in behavior. So these are some of the behavioral modification techniques uh, developed, and they include, of course, positive reinforcement. That's like catching them doing good. Um, negative reinforcement, punishment. Uh, sometimes uh, if a person was experiencing a phobia that was pretty crippling, like, you know, you can't drive over a bridge, then you could use a technique like systematic desensitization. Aversion therapy, that's like um, exposing you to toxic stuff in the environment and um, that would discourage you from behaving um, like this is being exposed to something like um, pornography. Someone's addicted to pornography. And so every time they see an image of pornography flashed on a screen, they deliver like an electric shock, okay? <laughs> so uh, flooding response prevention, thought stopping techniques. Again, these are all under that umbrella of behavioral modification. And of course, can be very effective and really they are basic. And you should remember this from your Psych 101 courses. Now, cognitive behavioral therapy, this is a must know. It is used all the time and it is very, very successful. It can be uh, used by the patients by themselves in the form of workbooks, um, training, uh, Nurses can help clients to develop these types of skills. So premise, how a person perceives or interprets his or her experiences determines how they will feel and behave. Okay. And so that means, however, whatever you're experiencing, if you perceive it, one, what, however way you perceive it, that's going to influence 
the way you feel and act. So imagine the power you can give your patients if they recognize how those thoughts contribute to their feelings and then how feelings contribute to behaviors and then how the behaviors contribute to recreating the thoughts. So Aaron Beck developed the uh, CBT uh, techniques and his whole theory was based on these you know, how thoughts influence feelings and behaviors. It's a beautiful thing. So our role is to teach our patients how they can work to improve their quality of life by recognizing the impact their thoughts have on their life. So if they change a negative thought to a positive thought, that can change the way they feel and change the way they behave. So CBT, again, very important. CBT can be used for depression, bipolar disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder. And if you're looking at combining therapies for most of the psychiatric conditions, you're gonna see take an SSRI and combine it with CBT and that's the recommended treatment. <laughs> and I mean, PTSD is a perfect example of that. Dialectical behavioral therapy is the treatment of choice for persons with borderline personality disorder. And that's a must know, you're gonna see that again. Dialectical behavioral therapy, applicable especially for borderline personality disorder. It really is, Think of CBT that is more in depth and it is more, of course, focused on not just the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, but they incorporate techniques that help with emotional regulation. So the person with borderline personality disorder has a lot of intense emotions uh, and they respond or have exaggerated responses. So, and those emotions often impact their ability to build healthy relationships. So one of the ways they help to create behavioral change is through mindfulness activities. And that means helping that person to get grounded and to recognize that just because they're feeling it doesn't make it real, that you don't have to react to it, that you need to think it through. Mindfulness activities include deep breathing, relaxation techniques, meditation, uh, tapping into your senses of smell, sight, sound, really helping folks to get connected to their bodies. Um, for persons with borderline personality disorder um, often have behaviors like self-injury. And self-injury, again, is a maladaptive coping skill, but think about it as for someone with borderline personality disorder, it's actually their form of a mindfulness activity because it's helping them to feel something. It's helping them to overcome their defense mechanism of dissociating. Okay, so CBT and DBT techniques rely on a couple of other types of activities that include kind of helping folks to set priorities. And when you're setting priorities, you're putting, um, you know, you learn how to recognize when you're making a mountain out of a molehill, 
Okay. So recognizing when, you know, um, I'm overreacting to something. I'm experiencing an intense emotion over someone canceling a lunch date, and that's really not appropriate. So priority restructuring. Journal keeping was really, really good because it allows for personal reflection. Assertiveness training, and that can mean teaching someone how to react in an assertive way rather than uh, responding in an aggressive way, which can be have very negative consequences. And also monitoring thoughts, and that goes back to keeping a journal. So recognizing when you're having a negative thought and recognizing what usually triggers that type of thought and changing your perception, okay? So those two past therapies, CBT and DBT, are very, very important. And as nurses, you really need to understand kind of that the underlying um, reasons and um, ways or those techniques that you can use to help um, persons, especially in crisis. So we're transitioning out of crisis intervention. And this is a directive intervention designed to really assess a person's health status in the moment of the crisis. Okay, so crisis intervention is not just about attending to someone's mental health needs, but it's focusing just on a single event and um, almost at a, a more of a basic level. And the, the aim is to help the person by um, help them to discuss their feelings about a particular traumatic event. So think about someone who's just been through a disaster, a mass disaster, or think about nurses who are in that, in that clinical setting who are exposed to uh, a lot of loss, maybe the, the death of a child in the emergency department. Is it, a, you know, not, I mean, it is an uncommon experience that can though, elicit very strong emotions and make it very difficult for a person to continue in their job if they were really impacted emotionally. One of the techniques for crisis intervention is um, a model called crisis or critical incident stress management. It used to be called critical incident, uh, incident stress or debriefing. And, you know, but this is the more popular term, uh, CISM. Uh, CISM programs are um, usually in uh, or within clinical settings and are utilized for those folks who work in, um, in EMS types of uh, careers, uh, healthcare careers, law enforcement, those types of things. But the Christ CISM teams can also respond in um, natural disasters, those types of things to help the lay public. Cultural considerations, very, very important as in, in how they apply to psychosocial theories or developmental theories. So uh, we know that the vast majority of the developmental theories, psychosocial theories that we've talked about in this particular lecture were, you know, applicable to white people born in the Europe or the United States. So we need to, of course, take into consideration the diversity uh, and, and the culture in, so that we can apply the types of techniques or these theories in, you know, that's relative or relevant for them. So recognize the limitations of the theories is the bottom line and that how these limitations must be viewed in the context of society as a whole. And that takes cultural humility. So here's some other treatment modalities uh, and that 
include community mental health treatment. We've uh, discussed that before. This is where our community services boards or CSBs come into play. Uh, community mental health treatment uh, is targeted mostly towards those individuals with serious mental illness that require case management uh, services and more intensive uh, therapies or treatment. Individual psychotherapy is more in line with, you know, CBT, DBT, uh, psychoanalysis, um, those, those types of um, treatments. Group therapies can include um, AA support groups, family uh, therapies, and can be very, very helpful. Group development, um, you know, of course, it depends on the group. However, all groups do have a beginning, a working, and a final stage. Um, however, programs or support groups, though, um, like Alcoholics Anonymous, can be long-lasting. There are open groups, closed groups, support groups, therapy groups, educational groups, lots and lots of different types of groups. I think that the your textbook covers this well, as well as um, your ATI book. So review the different types of groups and their purpose. Complementary and alternative therapies. Uh, these are important for us to be familiar with. Uh, often patients will partake in, you know, uh, in you may be herbal types of um, therapies, maybe yoga practices, acupuncture, biofeedback, those types of therapies that can be really, really helpful. And you know, we need to be familiar with how these types of medicines can be combined with conventional medical therapy. Psychiatric rehab can be helpful, especially for those folks who are coming out of a long-term facility or think about the person who's been in a 30-day rehab uh, treatment and they need to um, come back to uh, their community. They might opt instead to go to like a housing situation, um, and here's an example, the Oxford houses. Oxford houses are this like group of folks who live together in one house or apartment. There are set rules, they support one another, they help each other to stay sober or clean, and um, it's democratic, they have rules, they hold each other accountable. So then this person can transition from that situation back into maybe their, um, their previous living situation. Uh, it can also, um, there's other programs like the clubhouse model where folks transition from a state mental health facility back into the community and they go to this community model so that like the clubhouse model where they're, taught skills so that they can be more productive members of society and really establish or um, identify their own purpose. Okay, thank you very much. That's it.